Hi, and welcome to our presentation on navigating the transition from CPSI to EPIC. During this webcast, we'll be walking you through our experience helping a hospital convert clinical data from a CPSI system to an EPIC EHR. Let me start by introducing ourselves. My name is Erin Nisho. I'm a clinical conversion analyst here at Galen. I'm EPIC Willa certified, experienced project manager, and I've worked with EPIC and healthcare IT for over eight years. August Borey, my technical counterpart here, is a technical conversion analyst. Um, he's EPIC bridges certified, has five plus years of healthcare IT, um, and is, an, is experienced in conversions to EPIC from a variety of legacy systems. Here's our presentation outline. We've at, um, split out our webcast by different phases of the conversion. We'll start with a, a project overview and then talk about scoping, extraction, and mapping. Then August will talk about our technical approach and challenges. I'll finish up by talking about our validation, go live, and August will end with a summary of lessons learned. In late 2014, a client we had previously done a conversion for requested our assistance to help with another conversion. It was to convert a small hospital CPSI system to the, acquiring health, to the acquiring health system's EPIC EHR. Just to give you an overview of the scope, we've converted up to five years of clinical data from CPSI. We converted the data to EPIC using various formats. We converted encounters, smoking status, immunization history, imaging, scans, transcriptions, and vitals, all via uh, HL7 interfaces. Allergies were converted using CCDs, or continuity of care documents. We also used a flat file, an EPIC patient load utility, to convert the primary care providers. We also con converted five to 10 years of lab data, data from the client's soft lab system to EPIC. This was done via HL7 as well. Here are some stats from the conversion. Uh, for this conversion, we converted around 180,000 patients, half a million encounters, 185,000 transcriptions, um, around 800,000 vital signs, a little over 100,000 imaging results, 1.3 million scans, and about 60,000 active allergies. Also, just to note, we had done a previous conversion for this client. However, that was an ambulatory conversion, which was an all script touchworks conversion to EPIC. Conversions are typically split out into phases. I've outlined our milestone phases here. We start with project design, which includes project kickoff, system access, tech setup, scope refinement, and the project plan. The next phase is our data extraction and data analysis, which oftentimes leads to more scope refinement and depending on what we find, <clears throat> depending on what we find. Then we begin mapping. This is where we map data between the legacy and target EHRs. Mapping can happen throughout the project as new data is built or updated in the legacy system. We typically do new extractions before each validation session and map any new data, data elements at that time. We then complete four phases of validation, which I'll talk a lot, I'll, I'll talk about in more detail later. Go Live Prep is where we actually start to convert the historical data prior to the end user Go Live, then the actual end user Go Live and post Go Live support and subsequent gap loads. So here's a um, high-level view of our timeline. As you can see here, we have all the milestone phases listed out. We started the project in January of 2015 with a final end-user go live um, on July 1st. This um, particular inpatient conversion had a seven-month timeline. We typically need nine to 10 months for a full conversion, depending on the EHR we're working with and the data elements being converted. Uh, considering this was an inpatient conversion with a legacy EHR that we weren't completely familiar with, the timeline was one of our biggest challenges. I'm first going to talk about scope and timeline of the project. 
when I first started the project, the health system requiring the hospital being converted wanted me to meet with all their stakeholders to define and get approval on the scope of the conversion. I started by splitting the typical converted data elements into separate groups. I then held scoping meetings to review each of the data types in detail. During these meetings, I would try to get a complete picture of what and how the data was documented in CPSI. I then would explain how the data would appear in EPIC once converted. We broke everything down into how the data would be converted, how much of the data would be converted, and what types would be converted. I split the data into four stakeholder groups. I met with their lab and imaging teams to discuss results. I met with registration stakeholders to review patient demographics, encounters, and PCPs. I met with their various managers and HIM to discuss docu document conversion. And then I met with clinical leaders to review problems in as allergies, immunization, vitals, and, out and smoking. As we worked through the scoping, there are a few areas that needed special consideration. Typically, for an ambulatory conversion, you would convert all vital sign recordings because usually only one reading is taken per visit depending on the type of visit or clinic you're at. Um, however, for an inpatient conversion, they can take vital sign readings as often as every hour or even more frequently, fre frequently meaning that there could be a lot more vital sign data to convert. One option we came up with to resolve this issue was to only convert the last reading of each vital sign, such as the last type, weight, or blood pressure. However, by limiting the vitals to just the last reading, we would be eliminating the ability of the providers to graph based upon vital sign readings in EPIC. Ultimately, we weighed the need for graphing against the amount of data being converted and found it was reasonable to convert all vital sign readings for this conversion. Um, during the scoping meetings, I also found out that some of the hospital outpatient departments used other systems besides CPSI, such as Athena, Agility, and OBIC. Um, there was, of course, concern from their users about whether these systems would be included in the conversion. We ended up doing a detailed analysis on each system and eventually decided that most were out of scope for the conversion or would be dealt by another group or during another phase of the project. Another scoping issue that came up during the clinical content meetings um, concerned converting medications. It was discovered that medications were inconsistently documented in CPSI and most were on paper. So it was decided to exclude these from the conversion. And then during our first round of validation, we discovered that problems documented in CPSI were actually entered by their coders for billing purposes. It wouldn't match the preference list they had created for the provider in EPIC. Uh, because of this, the problems were also excluded from the conversion. During the doc document scoping session, I also spent quite a bit of time working with their HIM team and other various leaders to review their scan document types. We found that many of their scan types contained documents that weren't really clinically significant enough to convert. Uh, we went through each type and identified which ones uh, were needed in EPIC and which ones should be excluded. As with any project, staying on track can be a challenge. For this conversion, any time we had a scope adjustment after the initial scoping phase, it affected our already short timeline. Once something new was found or an existing scope of data was changed, we would often have to pause, discuss the situation, and get approval for the change. And then depending on what the change was, we might have to re-extract or change the configuration or formatting and retest. One timeline challenge we had was coordinating our patient load with the PACS conversion. We needed to make scheduling adjustments to aid the PACS conversion that was taking place at the same time as our conversion. Typically, we wait until closer to go live to load the, production, the patients into production. However, the PACS conversion needed the patients converted early on in the project. We were able to easily accommodate them. However, it did mean that we had to do more patient gap loads into production prior to loading all the clinical data. As August will talk about in more detail later, we also had some issues with formatting and the storage of the data in CPSI. 
which ultimately slowed down our extraction and validation phases. To overcome these delays, I scheduled separate validation sessions for the delayed data and pulled in more resources to validate the data in a shorter period of time. We also had some delays during the lab conversion due to the contracting process with the lab vendor. Uh, due to the delays, we were not able to convert all five to 10 years of data by the time of go live, but we did set the expectation that at least three years of the most recent data would be converted by the end user go live, and then the rest would be converted soon after. Another factor that affected our timeline was the amount of time it took to plan the cutover for an inpatient conversion. The cutover planning needed to start early and involved not just the conversion team, but also the implementation team. The cutover schedule was large, was a large undertaking, which took a lot of collaboration and time. And now I'm going to hand over the presentation to August, who will talk about our conversion platform and data extraction. Thanks, Aaron. Like Aaron just mentioned, now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the technical aspects of the conversion from CPSI to EPIC. First off, I want to highlight our conversion platform that we use at Galen. It's called Galen ETL, and it's a highly scalable vendor agnostic solution that allows Galen to provide consistent conversion and data transformation services, no matter how large or small the project, and no matter what systems we're working with. It's plugin based meaning that all of its functionality is built around the use of independent mini applications that are run, just depending on the different outputs that are desired. These different plugins can be strung together to manip manipulate the data in multiple ways. Galen ETL houses a centralized database where the data is stored within it. The schema is set up to hold many different kinds of data, including clinical data, patient-specific data, appointment data, and provider data, just to name a few. Speaking of outputs, Galen ETL can produce a multitude of different outputs. The most common one with respect to conversions to EPIC is HL7 messages. Galen ETL will take the data housed in this database and produce a fully formed, fully translated HL7 messages that are ready to be ingested by whatever system is the target. In our case, for this project, it was EPIC, and this is how the conversion was performed. Aaron also mentioned that allergies were converted as part of a CCD or continuity of care document. This is another common output for conversions to EPIC. All in all though, Galen ETL is excellent at extracting and transforming data from different legacy systems. Speaking of extraction, we have a general process for extracting conversion data that we follow, and we used it with this project. Anytime we go to extract data from an environment for the first time, whether it's from a system we are familiar with or not familiar with, we always have to tailor the extract scripts to the specific client's environment. This can involve making known changes based on the version of the application that's being used or based on the organization structure. If scanned images are in scope to convert, we will also need to make sure that we have access to the physical scanned image files themselves. We always like to validate our scripts against the data that the users are seeing in the application every day, so we compare data returned by the scripts to data that's in the front end view of the application just to make sure things line up. It isn't a long process to validate at this point, and Aaron's going to talk more about the true validation portion of the project later, but at this point it's just to ensure that things are looking good right from the get-go. We will then run the extract scripts during off hours, or in the case of this project in a hospital conversion, we'll run them during off-peak or slow hours, slow times. Another option is to provide a backup of the production database for us to work with, and then we can run our extracts whenever we want since we're not touching production. We will pull the data out and stage it in Galen ETL, like I mentioned earlier. And from here, we can do all of the data transformations and output generation that's needed. The final step of the extraction process is to generate the mapping workbooks. We'll talk a little bit more about mapping in the next couple of slides. And throughout the project, we'll be executing multiple extracts, including the final extract before the production load. And there are a few reasons to do this. One, it, it helps to identify new mappings that come up. 
because users are always adding new dictionary items into the system, so there will almost always be new items to map. It also helps to find new ways that data is being recorded that may cause different errors when data is being loaded into EPIC. In addition, it helps to determine the overall growth of the data set so we can plan for how much data will be needed when we need to load at GoLive. And finally, we'll be running multiple extracts to find any data that has been updated or deleted once the first load of data to EPIC has happened. These last types of extracts are known as gap extracts. Something that I just want to mention I think is important to mention in the, is that in the case of this project and CPSI, we weren't familiar with the application before the project started. We didn't have any prior experience with CPSI. We do have a, an experience converting data from multiple different EMRs, however, and we have our trusted relationship with the customer and we've proven ourselves to be able to get the data out of virtually any system for them. So they trusted us to tackle this system, CPSI, that we didn't have experience with and get the job done, which we did. So now I want to talk a little bit about the mapping process. The mapping process first begins by the creation of the mapping workbooks, like I mentioned in the last slide. There will be a mapping workbook for each data type. And these mapping workbooks are just going to be Excel files, Excel workbooks. To start off, Galen's clinical conversion analyst will do the initial mapping, and then they'll work with the client or the customer to review all of the mappings that have been done. For this project specifically, we had to map all of the CPSI data elements to their equivalents in EPIC. Sometimes we couldn't find matches in EPIC, and in these different types of scenarios, we would work with the client to either build new records in EPIC to match to, or we would build a conversion default record um, in EPIC, and then we could map any unmapped elements from CPSI to that conversion default record in EPIC. For example, in the cases of providers and departments, we would build a generic conversion record in EPIC. In the case of a provider, we would call it a, a conversion provider and there would also be a generic conversion department as well. So you can see in the bottom of the slide here, we have an example of an immunization mapping workbook. We have the CPSI information, the code, and the name for each immunization on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, we have the EPIC information for the code and name. And then all the way to the right, the last column, is called the usage and external system. And this is essentially how many times each item was used in the legacy system. And we use this number quite a lot in order to prioritize our mapping. So we'll often map by uh, in the order of the highest usage first, and then work our way down to get the highest number of items mapped as quickly as possible. We ran into a few roadblocks when it came to mapping certain elements for the conversion. To start off, a small percentage of the allergies in CPSI didn't have a name associated with them in the database. CPSI as an application allows users to manually enter allergen information for patients, and these entries weren't stored with the name of the allergen in the database. So we had one of Galen's clinical conversion resources go through the manual process of looking up the allergies in CPSI and matching them to the records that were extracted from the database. Generally, one of the more time-intensive and complex mappings are the order and result mappings. These involved mapping the CPSI order and result codes to the EPIC order and result codes. At the beginning of the project, we were provided with dictionary extracts from the lab system for the orders and results but unfortunately we realized that these extracts weren't complete, so we had many errors on the interfaces in EPIC when trying to look up the correct order and result records. Because of this, we worked those errors in EPIC in the interface, and when we came across an item that wasn't mapped, we would add it to the mapping tables or the translation tables so that it wouldn't err in the future. When it came to the scanned image type mapping, we were forced to make some choices about how we wanted to approach that exercise because CPSI contains some very specific scan types that were used quite frequently, while EPIC scan types were much more generic in name. 
and this made the mapping somewhat difficult to do. So we were either forced to map multiple CPSI scan types to the same EPIC scan type, so we had some granularity that was lost there. For scan types that were deemed necessary to have an EPIC, we would build a CPSI specific scan type to designate that and map the item from CPSI to that specific scan type. We mapped as many entries as we could based on the utilization um, and then worked our way down there. For the vital sign mappings, they're normally pretty straightforward. However, CPSI allowed for users to free text in the blood pressure location and blood pressure position. This resulted in hundreds of unique entries that were just too many to map. So again, we mapped as many as we could. And anything that actually didn't get mapped in this scenario was added to the comment section of the HL7 messages. So we didn't lose any data during the conversion. It was just that some of the values didn't come over discreetly. One of the more slightly in-depth mappings with this conversion was around the hospital service and patient class. These two mappings were in support of the inpatient encounters that we were converting. And they are multiple layers of mapping that further identify the type of encounter or visit that it is that we're converting. The hospital service defines a specialty within the hospital, i.e. hospice, OB, ICU, pain management, or et cetera. And the patient class is a more general determination of the type of hospital stay. And in our case, it was actually mapped from the CPSI stay type field. The three available options for the patient class were inpatient, outpatient, and emergency. And both of these mappings were driven by reporting initiatives that the customer had, and this allowed them to better drill down into the types of visits that were occurring in CPSI. One mapping related issue that we had was around duplicate patients. Early on, we identified a significant group of patient records in CPSI that had the same medical record number. In some cases, it appeared that the two records seemed to be the same patient. However, in other cases, they were clearly very different patients. To help resolve these, we worked collaboratively with an outside vendor that our customer has a long-standing relationship with. This vendor handles all of their duplicate cleanup efforts within Epic. So for our project, it made sense to continue working with them for the conversion activities with these duplicate patients. So they went through the list of duplicate patients that we provided to them to determine which sets of duplicates were in fact the same patient and which were not. We then worked with the customer to merge the true duplicates and further separate the profiles that shared an MRN but were actually different patients. And we would do this or they would do this by changing the MRN on one of the records one of those duplicate records. Of course, there was also the occurrences of the opposite scenario where there were two separate patient records with different MRNs in CPSI. However, they were actually the same patient. Um, these types of duplicates in this scenario were worked in EPIC by the same vendor once the patient load was complete. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the technical approach we took to some of the aspects of the conversion. One point, of, one point of emphasis with this project was a scanned image conversion. Since there were well over 1 million scanned images that stored in CPSI that we were converting, it was important to choose a method that could handle this volume efficiently. Ultimately, we chose to use Epic's web blob server for storing the legacy images. We chose this over using the on-base content management system that the customer had for a variety of reasons, and I'll just touch on a few key ones. By using the web blob server, we were able to use a dedicated interface for filing the scanned image data. With OnBase, however, there was only a single outbound interface from OnBase to Epic, so we would have been competing with real users scanning images, which is obviously not ideal. And it also meant that we could, set, we could only send through a small amount of data at a time to ensure that the production data from those users didn't get backed up. In reality, what this meant is that someone would have to manually send through small files of data one after another, waiting in between each one for the system to get caught up. 
Also, sending files to the blob server can be accomplished with the same group of resources that are involved with the conversion on a day-to-day -day basis. Since OnBase is a separate application, that would have meant, in order to use OnBase, it would have meant bringing in other resources to do that manual loading of the files that I just spoke about. And also, it's also easier to update and delete scans via the blob server during the gap load portion of the project because we can programmatically do it via the message type in the HL7 message. Since OnBase doesn't accept HL7 messages, it's a manual process to do that to delete the existing image and send in the updated version into OnBase. And this can obviously be a very time intensive process if there are many images to update or delete. So we made the decision to use the web blob server, but what does that really actually mean? There's a complex sequence that the data follows from the time we first send the data in to when a user can actually open up the image on a patient's chart in Epic. In order to send the images to the web blob server, first, we need to base64 encode the image file. This means taking the physical image file and turning it into a character representation of that file. This is then placed in an HL7 message, and it's sometimes referred to as an embedded document since it's embedded in the HL7 message. Then the HL7 message is sent to interconnect. And interconnect is a gateway that provides secure channels for moving information within your organization and also between your organization and an external system. It allows data to be sent to and retrieved from Chronicles, which is the Epic database. So interconnect receives the HL7 message with the embedded content. It decodes that content and stores the image file, the resulting image file, to the web blob server. Then it replaces that embedded content in the message with a pointer to that image file and sends the message on to the appropriate interface in Epic Bridges. So as you can see, it's quite a complex and complicated process, but it allowed us to work with a large amount of data totally within Epic's functionality. All along this process of doing the scanned image conversion, we're working with PDF documents because one, they're easy to work with and they're a wildly accepted file type. And I'll actually talk a little bit later about the challenges that we face getting this images from CPSI into a PDF format. For the lab conversion, we decided to convert the data from the laboratory information system itself, which was SoftLab in this case, we did this because the quality of the data that was in SoftLab was better than it was in CPSI. CPSI only stored the lab results in a semi-discrete manner, while we could pull a larger number of discrete data points directly from the laboratory information system, SoftLab. So to do this, we implemented a historical interface from SoftLab to send the HL7 messages directly to Epic. The messages were sent in batches to avoid performance issues on the SoftLab side, so we would receive the message in the interface engine and store them there before sending them on to Epic initially. Since we weren't using Galen ETL for this particular conversion, the data transformations and translations had to occur in the interface engine. We wanted to be able to set the translation tables as completely as possible prior to sending any messages to Epic, so this gave us more control over when and how the messages were sent on to Epic from the engine. We could change the batch size if we wanted to, so change how many messages were sent to Epic at once, and we were also able to run any necessary reports on the data set. There were several technical challenges that we faced throughout the project. Um, in a general sense, it was mostly because the data in CPSI was stored in some very unique and kind of difficult ways. With many systems, a lot of what we see is that much of the required data is stored in the database itself. With CPSI, that wasn't necessarily the case, though. Um, a good portion of the data that we sought was stored in flat files sitting on a CPSI server rather than in the database. For instance, if, say we're talking about a transcription, the metadata for that transcription, like the date and time, the provider associated with it, and maybe the transcription type, those might be in the database. However, the content of the note itself is contained in a text file sitting on a server. 
This would have been relatively straightforward if each text file contained a single transcription. However, there were many instances where a single text file might contain all of the transcriptions, imaging results, lab results, among other items for a patient for a single patient visit. So all of that information was contained in one file for a visit. It was then required to parse through the fi that single text file to pull out the information that we needed. Say we wanted just that transcription, we had to pull that just that information out. These visit files were then placed together with other visit files pertaining to similar account numbers, or in, you know, we call them visit numbers, and then those were zipped up into a single file. These zip files are then what's stored on the CPSI server. So to get at this data, it involved peeling back multiple layers until we were able to get to the specific item, specific piece of clinical data that we're looking for. Galen ETL's use of plugins allows for custom development to play a large role in projects such as this where there's an unusual need to get at data in a specific way. So for this project, we ended up building custom plugins to work with a number of the different data types, notes or transcriptions, imaging results, scanned images, and also the conversion of pathology data directly from SoftLab to SunQuest. With any conversion project like this, Galen ETL's development team can support us with these unique requirements that can arise. I would say through not only the hard work of the conversion project team specifically, but also the collaborative expertise of Galen as a whole, including the development team, uh, we were able to overcome these obstacles with this project and it really truly was a team effort. Probably the biggest challenge that we faced with the conversion from a technical perspective was surrounding the scanned images, kind of like I was mentioning earlier. The majority of the images in CPSI were stored in a proprietary format created by CPSCAN, which was CPSI's image scanning component. There were a number of smaller, a smaller number of files that were stored in other formats like PDF, uh, DOCX, which is Microsoft Word, JPEG, and Bitmap. These other file types were pretty straightforward to convert, at least in the case of PDFs, they were already in the format we were looking for, so we could leave those alone. And we already had the capability to convert the other file types, like, P like uh, JPEG and Bitmap, and then along with the Word documents too, with existing Galen ETL plugins. The CP scan images, however, presented a new and unique challenge for us. And in the end, like I mentioned in the last slide, we had a, a custom plugin developed designed specifically to handle these CP scan images and convert them to PDF. Because of the intricacies with how the images are stored in CPSI, a separate dedicated server was needed to run the conversion from CP scan to PDF. Since there were over 1 million scanned images, like I mentioned earlier, stored in CPSI, we were able to let the process run on the dedicated server separately and use other environments that we were already using for our day-to-day -day conversion activities. And also, like I mentioned in the last slide, scanned images were one of the data types that were stored in a zipped folder format. Specifically, many of the image files were grouped together based on account or visit number, and then those were zipped up together. One positive, however, of the CP scan image format was that all pages for a single document were stored within the same file so we weren't forced to combine multiple pages together into the same PDF. Some EMRs that we've worked with in the past can store each page for a given document as a separate physical file, and then we have to combine them all, all the pages to make one final document. We also ran into a number of the CP scan images that resulted in very large PDFs. We actually had some PDFs that were over 50 megabytes in size. There were some initial issues um, that we had generating these large files, these large PDFs, and sending them through the interface engine. However, we were able to resolve most of them by making some changes to our conversion process. In a few of the outlying cases, though, the, some of the PDFs were simply too large to send through the engine, and those were en manually printed out and scanned into Epic. As you can imagine and see, the, uh, the scanned images went through a complex life cycle on the way from CP scan 
a CP scan image all the way to being a scanned image in EPIC. So to recap, first they would start out zipped and compressed in a folder with other files sitting on, a C sitting on the CPSI server. And then the custom plugin extracted a single CP scan file and converted it to PDF. Galen ETL then converted the PDF to the Base64 embedded content, like I was mentioning earlier, put that in an HL7 message, and then followed up by sending that HL7 message to EPIC and storing the PDF on the web blob server. Another unique feature of the way that the CPSI data was stored is a designation between active and archive data. Active data is more recent data and is stored in a certain one location on the CPSI server after a certain number of days, and this can be changed per customer via setting, the data then moves to the archive location. This is kind of what I was talking about earlier in reference to the imaging results and nodes and et cetera being sometimes stored in a single file per item, per, per clinical item, and sometimes being combined together for a single visit. In the active location, each item had its own file. However, in the archive location, visit level data was combined together into the same file, that same text file, and then zipped up with other visit files. This became very impor important for us when we were planning to do the gap extracts because we had to account for the location of all of the new and updated information. There were instances where an item from the active location may have been updated, but by the time it was updated, it had moved to the archive location. So we had to be aware of that and make sure we looked in the correct location for each data element. And luckily for us, this logic was programmed into the custom plugin that was created for us. The custom plugin that we created, rather. We also had a similar scenario with the encounters. While there was no data stored on the CPSI server for encounters, and all of the data was stored in the database, encounters still moved from an active table in the database to our historical table. This also happened based on a day threshold that was set at the client site. So we had to keep track of these encounters that were transitioning to historical as there could still be transcriptions, results, or other clinical data associated with that encounter. And all in all, these are just a couple of examples um, of the complex ways in which CPSI stores its data. When it came to executing the gap conversion, CPSI again was limiting in what was available to extract from the database. Generally, when we're extracting gap data from a system, we like to use a last updated date or created date to signify when a particular clinical item was either last touched within the application or when it was entered into the system. For instance, if we did an extract on October 1st and loaded that data to EPIC, for the following gap extract, we would want to look for data that had a last updated date after October 1st in the database. This would indicate that the data was updated in CPSI in some way, and we would want to file that update to EPIC. In most cases, CPSI didn't record these types of dates within the database for us to key off of. So we had to rely on workflow testing conduct conducted by our clinical conversion analysts to determine what what and how clinical data could be updated and deleted within CPSI. This told us what to look for in the database in terms of data to extract. In the case of imaging results, though, we determined that it was possible for addendums to be added to the existing results. However, there wasn't a way to recognize this from the database perspective. Therefore, we worked with the customer to keep track of the addendums manually, and they were added to EPIC at a later date. For these, we kept the gap windows as short as possible with, with the imaging results to cut down the number of addendums that they had to add manually. Encounters also presented a unique scenario for us because there wasn't a way to tell from a database perspective what had been updated. In addition, the path to updating an encounter through the application wasn't very clear. So for each gap extract, we compared different data points of each encounter between the versions. We compare the associated providers, um, admit discharge dates and departments, to name a few of the data points, to see if anything had changed since the last extract. 
This obviously isn't an ideal way of generating a gap data set, but it was necessary for this project. And last on our list of technical challenges were some of the imaging results. Imaging results were stored in a rich text format or RTF format in CPSI, and in some cases they contain pictures or images within that text. When this happened, the number of characters in the RTF text ballooned to a huge number. If the number of the characters got too large, the result wouldn't file to EPIC on the interface, it would actually hang the interface. There were a handful of these results that weren't able to be filed, so those were also manually printed out and scanned into EPIC. And now I'll pass it back over to Aaron to talk about testing and validation. Thanks, August. So for this conversion, we had four phases of testing. We started with the initial unit testing, Unit testing is where you test the interface connections and message formatting. The testing was completed by the Galen conversion analyst for this project. We then moved on to small scale validation. We typically test between five and 20 patients to look for any obvious display issues with the converted data. This validation is typically just completed by the Galen conversion analyst, uh, but sometimes the project team members uh, want to be involved, so we include them if they want to. Large-scale validation is next. This is where we test each and every mapping for all data types. For instance, August showed you a screenshot of the immunization mapping earlier. For large-scale, we would test every single one of those mapped immunizations. Large-scale usually involves the Galen conversion analyst and the project team. Uh, for the CPSI conversion, we also included the end users as well. So the last phase is full-scale validation. This is where we convert all the data in, uh, included in the scope. Um, we'll test a large sample size of the data to find any infrequent or uncommon issues not found during the previous testing rounds. We'll also have the end users involved to help test the downstream workflow to make sure that everything is working as expected. The testing phases may seem simple enough, however, there are some specific things we had to take into consideration during this stage of, of the project. One such issue was how to deal with delays. As mentioned before, we had a few delays during the conversion process which affected validation. In most cases, uh, certain data types weren't ready for testing during the scheduled validation session. Uh, this meant we would have to schedule separate validation sessions for these data elements. In order to complete the testing and make um, up time for the delay, we would enlist scale and validation resources um, so we could test the same amount of data, but it do in a shorter period of time. Another consideration to think about when planning a validation session is to just try to get as many validation resources scheduled ahead of time as possible. Our Galen team can provide validation resources, but it's really important for the client to validate the data as well and be able to sign off on the validation in the end. For an inpatient conversion, it was difficult to schedule end users since most don't have office hours or flexible schedules. However, we typically pitch, in, um, pitch it as a great way for people to learn how to use EPIC ahead of time and also get a feel for how the data will look once it's converted to EPIC, giving them a step up. Uh, this sometimes helps to incentivize participation. Another big part of validation is to make sure that you test your gap load. Um, along with importing any new data during the gap load, you will be also importing any modified or deleted data from the time of the first import. It's important to identify all types of scenarios and make sure data still looks good and epic after the conversion. It was also important for us to test the downstream workflows affected by the converted data. For instance, as I stated before, we converted all the vital sign data to let the providers be able to graph based upon the readings and other factors. Um, we would then test the synopsis report in EPIC to make sure that that graphing worked as, ex as expected. Now I'm going to talk about go-live planning. Planning the cutover process for a hospital EHR implementation can be a daunting task so the earlier you start planning, the better. It was very important that the conversion team and the implementation team work together to create a plan. 
open communication uh, really is the key to a successful go live. There was a very large project plan for the EPIC implementation of which the conversion was a small piece. However, it was really important that we also have our own step-by-step -step cutover plan just for the conversion. Our cutover plan detailed each task, owner, start and finish, start date, time, and date and time, and also included the communication plan for each person. As one step was completed, it was really important to notify the rest of the team so the next steps could be taken. As the project manager, I oversaw each step and assisted with the communication. We also used the import time estimates from validation to estimate how much time the import would take in production. These were detailed in our cutover plan. As I said before, we had done a previous conversion for this client, so we were able to use those times to make a better estimation on import timing. During the go-live planning, a lot of consideration went into overcoming some of the obstacles that came with a hospital conversion. First, you have to address the fact that a hospital never closes and how will you convert the most up-to-date information on the patients at the time of cutover as quickly as possible. Also, what's the plan for the admitted patients? How will their data from the open admissions and PPSI be transferred to EPIC? Another area of consideration is what to do about open encounters due to admissions and reoccurring encounters in an inpatient setting. I'll go over each of these in more detail now. Typically for an ambulatory conversion, we only do about one to two pre-go-live gas loads. However, since this was an inpatient conversion and the client did not have any real-time historical interfaces set up, uh, but also wanted, a, wanted the most up-to-date information added to the patient's chart as quickly as possible, we had to increase the number of gap loads done prior to go-live. To accommodate this plan, we needed to create an intense pre-go-live gap load schedule. When converting data, the more data you have, the longer it takes to import. The idea here was to do multiple smaller gap loads prior to go-live so we could import all information in a short period of time and reduce the amount of time the end users were without critical data. The initial load began two weeks prior to go-live. Then we did a gap load 48 and 24 hours prior to go live. And then for the data elements that needed to be converted on the admitted patients, we did a gap load three hours prior to go live and then at midnight, which was the time of cutover. The midnight extraction still took a couple of hours to fully import into Epic, but this was as close to real time as we could make it without having uh, live interfaces set up. Any clinically critical data that needed to be on the admitted patients at the time of cutover was either manually entered or they referenced in CTSI. As we were nearing the go live, we were asked to convert clinical data on the admitted patients at the time of cutover. Previously, we had discussed only converting data on closed or discharged visits, but after discussing our options, we decided that some of the clinical data would be manually abstracted on the admitted patients, such as allergies, and other data types would be converted via an interface, such as results and transcription. We knew they were going to manually register the admitted patients in EPIC and create brand new encounters. Normally, in order to convert data and have it match to an encounter in EPIC, we would convert the CPSI visit ID into the external visit ID on a converted encounter in EPIC. By doing this, the clinical data was sent to the CPSI visit ID and then matched <laughs> to the correct encounter in EPIC. However, they were creating new encounters in EPIC for the admitted patients. We knew those encounters wouldn't have the CPSI visit ID to match on. To resolve this issue, we had to have registration manually add the CPSI visit ID on the new EPIC encounters when they were created. In this case, it worked because it was a small hospital with low admissions. However, other options may have to be used if the hospital has higher admission counts at the time of cutover. 
Originally, as I said before, the conversion scope only consisted of converting closed or discharged encounters. However, during the visit extraction from CPSI, we noticed that there were many encounters without a discharge date or they were still open. There were three types. Um, there were old encounters that were never, enclosed, never closed for some reason. Most likely they were just missed. Um, then there were reoccurring encounters for different uh, types of therapy visits. And then lastly, there were the currently admitted patients. Um, their encounters were also open. We worked with the client to decide to determine the best approach for each. The old encounters without a discharge date were converted with a discharge date of the go-live date. The reoccurring encounters, we gave them a period of time to close them manually in CPSI. Uh, if they still weren't closed by the last post-go-live gap load, they were also converted with the go-live date as a discharge date. And then current admission encounters were not converted at all. As I said um, in the last slide, any patient admitted at the time of cutover had a new admission encounter manually created in EPIC and we converted the clinical data on the new encounter in EPIC. Because of this, we did not have to convert the historical encounter um, or it would have displayed as a duplicate. And now August is going to talk um, about some of our lessons learned. Thanks, Erin. Yeah, I just wanted to review some of the lessons learned that we have covered during the presentation today. So to start off, when it comes to scoping the conversion and deciding what and how much of each data type to convert, make sure to identify all of the different legacy systems that are currently in use in your organization. The earlier you can do this, the better, as there will likely be people wondering if each system is staying or going away once a conversion has happened. Also, be aware of any unusual workflows that are happening in the legacy system. During the conversion is a perfect time to update or correct an odd or inefficient workflow. These workflows can affect how data is stored or transmitted in the legacy system, which will affect how it can be converted. Like I kind of talked about earlier, we ran into some issues extracting the data from CPSI. Our development team, though, was ready and waiting to build custom plugins for us to be able to break through these barriers and get at the data that was stored in CPSI. We were also limited in our gap extracts and conversion by the versioning and audit information that was captured or really wasn't captured by CPSI. The database didn't contain many of the fields that we like to have for a gap conversion, so we were forced to use other methods to make the conversion successful. Anytime you can identify duplicate patients early on in the conversion, uh, the better off you'll be there. This will help cut down the duplicate percentage of patients in, in the target system and will cause less errors in the interface because the correct patient can't be found. In talking about the cutover approach, um, the cutover is obviously a crucial part of the conversion project and we like just like to say plan, plan, and then plan some more for whatever tasks and responsibilities will take place during the cutover time. Everyone's going to be stressed during that time so having a concrete plan in place ahead of time will help tremendously. Also, consider using live interfaces for the time leading up to cutover through after cutover. This can help alleviate some pressure of doing gap extracts and loads right at cutover time and will help ensure that EPIC stays in sync with the legacy systems until they're turned off. For example, if we're talking about um, the lab results, we could load all historical lab results up to one month prior to go live. Once those are loaded, we could turn on a live interface that will feed EPIC with any new or updated data that's occurring in the legacy system. And last but not least, think about any post go live activities. When will those legacy systems be sunsetted and turned off? Um, nobody wants to pay licensing and support fees forever for systems that are no longer in use. So on that note, Galen has a product called Vital Center Online Archival, which is a fully featured archival solution for your legacy EMR and ancillary systems. It provides simple, straightforward access to the clinical data that allows you to turn off those old systems. It can even provide auditing information as well. And it will also 
combine data from multiple legacy systems into one single repository so users don't have to look in multiple places to find the data. So consider Vital Center Online Archival and Galen for your next conversion project. And I also just want to quickly cover a little bit more about our conversion services that we offer at Galen. Each conversion that Galen will perform can, will be resourced with a minimum of one clinical conversion analyst that will manage the individual conversion project and also lead the mapping of the nomenclatures, translations, and then the validation effort as well. There will be one, at least one technical conversion analyst that will perform the technical back-end work of actually moving the data, which includes uh, the extracting the data, tr the data transformation, so getting the discrete data into a format that they can be accepted by the target system, and then also includes loading the data into the target system. For a larger enterprise conversion that's going to consist of multiple systems, we will also staff a conversion program manager necessary to have one of these senior project managers on the project who, who's intimately uh, familiar with the conversion process and they can kind of oversee and manage the entire conversion project. So contact us today. Great, and that wraps up our presentation for today. Um, you can find a recording of this webcast on our uh, external wiki. Um, you can get there through our website, galenhealthcare.com. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.